Good morning, church. Welcome to Lifeway Church. My name, if we haven't met before, my name is Christine Crowley, and I am the children's pastor here at Lifeway. Thank you, thank you. Um, Before we begin, though, I want to say happy Father's Day to all of our dads, our granddads, our fur dads, so Silas's first Father's Day, uncles, and honestly, anybody who you love as a child, happy Father's Day. I am so excited that you're joining us today as we are going into part three of our series called God's Story. In week one, if you remember, Pastor Steve told you about his first experience with the Bible, and I thought it would be fun to tell you about my first experience. So I grew up in a mostly non-practicing Catholic home. Um, The Bible wasn't something that we were ever really exposed to. I mean, we had a family Bible. It was a giant Bible, and it laid open. I don't even know where it laid open to, but it laid open on a hutch as you entered into the house. But it wasn't anything that I ever remember anybody reading from, and honestly, I don't even think we were allowed to touch it. Now, my catechism teacher, so if you, if you don't know what catechism is, catechism is like Sunday school, only it doesn't take place on Sunday. It takes place like during the week. Um, but my catechism teacher explained that the Bible was really for the priest to interpret And we would learn all that we needed to know, either going to church on Sunday or going to catechism. So my first understanding of the Bible is that it was too holy and far too difficult for the average person to understand. So as a very young adult, as I accepted Jesus as my Lord, I was faced with the daunting task that every new believer is faced with. Read your Bible. It was overwhelming to me. In my eyes, the Bible was this huge ancient text that didn't pertain to me at all, and it was very difficult to understand. Now, I know now that that's not true. (laughs) Um, But little by little, with every effort that I put forth, God met me. He provided either a supernatural understanding or he would provide someone that would help me unpack what I just learned. I also remember that I had signed up for a small group, and our small group was a place where fellow believers could talk about God's word, what they had discovered, or simply just ask a question. So I actually began to learn a whole lot. But I also used to believe that once you read the Bible once, it was like a one and done, right? You read it once, you know everything that you need to know. I really couldn't understand why there were people who would read the Bible once a year, over and over again. Isn't one or two times enough, I thought? Anyways, about 20 years ago, I was, I'm a nurse by by training. And so 20 years ago, I was working um, as a nurse on the night shift. And I had a fellow nurse. Her name was Becky. And she was a fellow believer. And Becky would pull out, she had a very large Bible. She would pull it out every night around 3 a.m. when we were done with our rounds. And she would read it. And I remember the night that she had completed one of her read-throughs. And she said, okay back to the beginning, and I was completely confused as I saw her take this huge Bible, flip to the beginning of the Bible, and open up to Genesis and start all over again. I didn't understand why. I felt like it would be like reading a novel over and over again. I mean, once you know how it ends, what is the point? But Becky explained to me that there was so much to uncover in the Bible that every time that she would read it, she would discover something new. And depending on what was going on in her life, she would see things from a different perspective. And as I have grown in my faith, I couldn't agree with Becky more. God's word is like a toy that never gets old or a storyline that exposes more detail with every read. There are intriguing main characters. There are tons of supporting characters. There are plots and subplots. But collectively, they all tell one story. And that's what this series is all about. We are unlocking the key to the meaning of the Bible by discovering the unified story within its pages. And our hope for you is that you will find your story inside of God's story. In the first week of the series, Pastor Steve introduced the first two movements. So if you remember, it was God's good creation and our royal task. So God created this beautiful, glorious world and everything that was in it. And he gave the humans the royal task of ruling over that creation. So that was our first movement. Our second movement was our rebellion and the fallout. Adam and Eve rejected God's definition of good and evil, and they inserted their own. And then in last week, Pastor Steve introduced our third movement, 
which is God's covenant with Israel. And the third movement actually covers three different subplots. Pastor Steve covered one last week, where, where God chose Israel to bless all of the nations. And this week's subplot, or big idea, is Israel's royal failure. Sounds really inspiring, right? All right, so maybe it's not the most uplifting big idea ever, but I promise it's really interesting and it's critical to God's story. And then next week we'll learn about Israel's exile and the prophetic hope, and then after that we'll move into the New Testament. When I was younger, I hated reading. I mean, I really hated reading. I would do anything I could to get out of reading a novel or chapter books. And as I got older and into high school, I discovered cliff notes. If you don't know what cliff notes are, it's a high-level summary in just a few pages. So if you had to read a 600-page book, you could get a high-level summary in maybe like 20 to 30 pages. So that's what I'm going to do for you today. I'm going to give you a high-level summary of all the books between Joshua and 2 Kings. So that's Joshua, Judges. Well, actually, there's Ruth that comes next, but she's like three pages, so you're on your own. You have to read her. And then there's 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, so we're going to go through six books. Now, I did a ton of study for today's message, but honestly, I didn't spend any time researching Cliff Notes, so I have no idea if Cliff is somebody's first name, their last name, or if it's a publisher, but I know that my name is not Cliff, so I am going to give you Chris Notes. So we're going to go through Joshua to 2nd Kings, so here's your Chris Notes. Joshua picks up right after Moses dies. Joshua leads God's people into the promised land. Now, this was the land that God had promised Israel through Abraham. All they had to do now was enter it and take possession of it. And so that's what they did. They entered it and fought many battles to drive out the very evil Canaanites so that they could inhabit the land. Then Joshua divided up the land between the 12 tribes of Israel. Joshua 21:45 says, "'Not one of all of the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. So the Lord made good on all of his promises, all of them. Then just before Joshua's death, he assembled all of the tribes of Israel and reminded them of all the amazing things that God had done for them. And he also reminded them of their covenant. Joshua 24, 14 says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. We're going to skip down to verse 19. Then Joshua warned the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you. So we're going to remember this. Okay? If you abandon the Lord, Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. Verse 21 says, But the people answered Joshua and said, No, we will serve the Lord. So the people of Israel promised to serve the Lord. They promised to never turn away from the Lord, and they promised to never serve other gods. Verse 31 says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done. And then we turn the page and go into Judges, our next book. And by chapter 2, the Bible tells us that the next generation royally failed. They neither knew the Lord or they neither, they neither knew the Lord or anything that they had done for him. It says that they had done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, they followed and worshipped the various gods of the people around them. Seriously, this is the very next generation. I called my mom and I was trying to think of like a warning or something, some good advice that was passed from generation to generation. And honestly, we found a couple. But the fact was, is that my mother would tell me something and I would do the exact opposite. My grandmother would tell my mother something and she did the exact opposite. So I had no really good, had no good example here. So just as promised, God's anger burned against them, and he gave the Israelites over to their enemies until the Israelites cried out to God, and then God would send a deliverer, or a judge, hence the name of the book, to save them. Judges 2.23 says, Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed them and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. 
they refuse to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. This cycle of failure happened over and over and over. Now, Chris Notes won't go into every judge, but I believe there was like 15 of them. So this cycle happened many times, right? Israel would fail, begin to worship other gods. God would put them into captivity. Then they would cry out to the Lord. Then the Lord would send them a deliverer. The deliverer would die, and they'd start all over again. Have you ever watched a movie where the storyline is really intense but also ridiculously predictable and you know that the main character is going to walk right into whatever trouble or disaster but that they have been desperately trying to avoid the entire movie and you're just thinking don't do it run the other way well it's a little like reading judges if you consider the main character israel you want to yell out come on israel don't do it back away from the false gods as frustrating as it is, Judges is still a very good read, and I highly recommend it. Then, First and Second Samuel usher in the kings of Israel, which sounds like a good thing, right? It's not. It's just another stubborn move of God's people and an epic failure. You see, Israel demands a king. Up until this point, God was their king. God ruled over them. The elders of Israel approached Samuel, who was a prophet of the Lord, with this demand, and the Bible says that Israel was displeased with this request, but the Lord tells him in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, he says, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Samuel then goes on to warn the Israelites of the consequence of a king to reign over them. He explains, human kings will oppress you, Human kings will take your sons into service. Human kings will take a tenth of everything that you own. But they persisted. And verse 19 says, But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. We want to be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. My heart sunk the first time I read this. They had forgot all that God had done with them, done for them. This was the ultimate rejection of God by his people. They were rejecting him as their king, and I cannot imagine how much this hurt our Lord. However, God gave them what they asked for, and he anointed a king. So the rest of 1 and 2 Samuel focuses on the first two kings of Israel. So our main characters here are Saul and David. Saul was the first king who started off okay, but then he turned from the Lord and began to follow the gods of other nations. Shocking, right? You can see the cycle repeating even with the kings. Then the next king, so the second king, David, was the most famous and loved kings. In fact, Samuel called David a man after God's own heart as he anointed him as Saul's successor. But even David had a major moral failure. You see, David decided for himself what was right, was right, and he ignored God's law. Now, David's son, Solomon, Israel's third king, his reign is covered in first kings. So we're going to spend some time on Solomon today, but first I'm going to finish my Chris notes and get you all the way through second kings. So the rest of first kings, first kings covers Solomon's reign. And then after Solomon's reign, the nation of Israel divides into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the remainder of first and second kings covers the rest of the kings, and they were mostly awful kings who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There was a couple of okay ones in there, but eventually both kingdoms would fall. Now we're going to get into that more next week. So we're going to head back to our main character and the third king of Israel, Solomon. The Bible says that Solomon loved the Lord. If you remember, he was, he was the king that when God asked him what he could do for him, meaning Solomon could have asked God for anything. He could have asked him for a longer life, more riches. He could have asked him for, for power, but that's not what he asked for. Solomon asked for wisdom. He asked God for a discerning heart so that he could distinguish between right and wrong and therefore faithfully govern God's people. The Bible says that the Lord was so pleased with Solomon's request. And because he didn't ask for any worldly possessions, God gave him the wisdom he requested, and he gave him everything he didn't request. Solomon had wealth, power, fame, and wisdom like no one had ever witnessed before. 
In fact, he led all of Israel into peace and prosperity during his 40-year reign. Solomon was also the one chosen to build the Lord's temple. If you remember David, Solomon's father, desperately desired to build a glorious temple for the Lord. But God said, no, David. But it was Solomon. He was the one, and so he built the temple. But eventually, and predictably, he fails too. Only Solomon fails miserably. This is going to bring us to our main text today, which is 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to focus on verse 1 through 6 and 9 and 10. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Eden, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyways. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. It's a thousand wives. Verse 4, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and he refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So Solomon, our, our main character here, had everything. Yet he still failed. So how did he fall so far? And I think the important thing to understand here is that it didn't happen overnight. In fact, none of the failures that we've talked about today happened overnight. There was a gradual decline and there were warning signs. So today, we're gonna talk about three signs that you're the main character headed for a royal failure. So your first sign, first sign that we're headed for a royal failure. One. You ignore God's instruction. So if we go back to verse 2 of our main text. It says, The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, You must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyways. So Solomon decided to choose what was right for himself. He says, Yeah, I don't like your ways, God. I'm going to do what's right for me. Solomon ignored God's command to, uh, not to intermarry with the Canaanites. God, God knew what it would do. He, he knew it would turn the, his heart away from, he knew he would turn their hearts away from the Lord. Solomon not only ignored that command, he also ignored another one. You see, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, God commanded the kings. He says, he must not marry many wives or his heart will be led astray. Many wives. I'm pretty sure a thousand wives counts as many wives, right? I mean, a thousand wives, if you think about it. I was thinking about it earlier. I'm like, there's 365 days in the year. I wonder if he just didn't know all of his wives, right? I have this picture in my mind that he's walking through the palace halls and he has his advisor next to him and he's like, oh, who's that girl? Because we know he likes women, right? Oh, who's that girl? His advisor, his, his advisor is like, dude, that's your wife. I'm sure he didn't know them all. Anyways, our second sign or a second sign that you are the main character headed for a royal failure you worship other gods we're going to go back to first we're going to go back to verse four in solomon's old age okay so it's in solomon's old age remember it didn't happen overnight they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the lord his god as his father david had been so initially Solomon tolerated his wife's false gods, but then he began to depend on them. He began to take part in the worship of these gods. And some of the rituals of these false gods were absolutely heinous. The worship of the Ammonite god Molech involved child sacrifice. But you see, Solomon's small G god didn't start off with a god of Molech. 
It began with his love for women. If you go back to the first verse of our main text, it says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Solomon's love for women became an idol. It became a replacement for God. So it got me thinking, what are the small G's or the idols in our life? What are the things that maybe seem a little bit harmless at first, but eventually over time start to take the place of our Lord? Maybe it's Netflix, something as innocent as Netflix. Maybe we start to binge watch. Social media, maybe we spend hours scrolling social media. Maybe it's compulsive gaming, compulsive shopping. Could even be an obsession with the relationships in your life. Now, these things in themselves aren't necessarily bad, right? You should have relationships, you can go shopping. But for some of us, maybe they've become our main focus. Maybe they've turned our focus away from what's really important. For me, I'm going to be a little transparent with you guys. For me, it's YouTube. And specifically, it's van life on YouTube. Do you guys know what van life is? Okay, I brought pictures anyway, so you... If you don't know what I'm talking about, I think we have a... Oh, it's right here. So essentially, people take a simple van and they build it out so they can live in it and drive in it. Think about it. You can drive anywhere. Your home is like always in the back seat. Life could be one giant road trip. So I don't know. Honestly, I don't really know why this appeals to me. And those of you in here who know me know that I can be, you know, a little bit of a princess. I hate bugs. I'm afraid of most animals. And I'm not really fond of being outside for long periods of time. I mean, really poor excuse for an Italian. I burn like crazy. But I consume van life videos like children consume candy. And the more stressed out I am, the more I watch. And this can be a huge issue for me because when I'm really stressed out, I shouldn't turn to van life videos. I should turn to the Lord my God for my relief. Van life videos just serve as a temporary temporary distraction. It eats up a lot of my time, but it doesn't solve anything. Really, all I'm doing is I'm taking, my pre- I'm taking precious time away from my Lord, and I'm giving it to a God replacement. Okay, so there's no need to throw an intervention for me. I have stopped watching van life videos. I have realized what they've done, so I've taken a break from them. But you can see how something as benign or innocent as van life video can, be, can serve as an idol. Little by little, we take our time away, we take our devotion, We take it from God and we give it to something else. Remember, Joshua warned God's people that the Lord is a holy and jealous God. God doesn't wish to be replaced. He wants to be the source of our comfort. He wants to be the source of our relief and our strength. So our third sign that you're the main character headed for a royal failure is you turn your heart away from the Lord. Verse 9 says that the Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. Now, I don't know if the third one is truly a sign. I actually think it's a result of the first two, right? If we ignore God's instruction, if we insert what we think is right instead of God, if we start taking our time away from him, taking our devotion and focusing it other places, eventually our heart will be completely turned away from the Lord. Now, normally at this part, point in a sermon, we would discuss our application. I gave you three signs that we're headed for a royal failure, so our application could just be, well, you know, like do the opposite. <laughs> Don't ignore God. Meditate on his word both day and night. Don't turn your heart from the Lord. Love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strengths. And don't worship other gods. Step away from the idols. But I think it's important to understand why Israel failed. Why do we fail? I mean, following the Lord with all of your heart and not worshiping other gods seems pretty straightforward, right? It's pretty simple. So why is there such a cycle of failure? The Israelites, David, Solomon, they were all God's elect, meaning God chose them to be the carriers of his promise to all people. They also had incredible benefits. God was with them. He gave them victory over their enemies. He gave them favor. 
the Israelites could have proclaimed to every person, every nation, look what my God has done. Look what he has done for Israel. Look what God has done for me. The other nations could have looked upon Israel with envy and desire to know, who is this God that they serve? But the Israelites didn't do that. Instead, they took a look around them and said, I think I'd rather be like everyone else. They denied God's rightful place in their life. They denied God as their king, and I believe they despised their royal election. There should have been a clear difference between the behaviors of the Israelites and the behaviors of the Canaanites, right? But there wasn't. God's chosen were worshiping the same false gods. They were committing the same sins as the rest of the nations. God gave Israel everything, yet they rejected it all. Thankfully, God's plan to bless all nations through the one small nation of Israel succeeded anyway. Israel failed, but God didn't. The world's salvation did come out of the small nation of Israel. His name is Jesus. His royal task was restoring all people to the Father by becoming the very sin that separated us so that he could defeat it by his death on the cross. He was raised to life three days later so that we too could have everlasting life. God's plan succeeded. Now anyone, any man, any woman, from any nation, from any background, could enter the promise of the elect through repentance and through faith in Jesus. Which means we who have repented and have put our faith in Christ, we are God's chosen. We are the elect. We have God's favor. So if you're here today and you're a fellow believer, let me ask you this question. Is there a difference between our behavior as God's people and the behavior of the rest of the world? Do we shout from the rooftops or tell our friends and neighbors all that God has done for us? Do we proclaim that we've been freed from sin and now we are sons or daughters of the Most High? Do we, give people to look, do we give people a reason to look at us and say, who is this God that they worship? I want to know him. Or do we look around and say, I think I'd rather be like everyone else. I want to have money. I want to have fame. I want a house like everyone has. In fact, I want to have and do the things that everyone else is doing. Jeremiah 10.5 says, like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. Their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. We need to remember that the things of this world, the things that are idols that we have replaced God with, they have no real power. Fame can't heal us. Money can't save us. A great job won't love us or care for us. And social media won't help us love others. These things offer a temporary distra distraction or a moment of gratification, but they do not get at our root problem. And the root cause of our issues is that we are broken. We are incomplete. We are in need of a savior, and we are not whole without our Lord. And when we walk away from him, we desperately try and fill that emptiness with anything that will provide a moment of pleasure or a moment of relief. But there isn't anything that truly satisfies our longing. Have you guys ever gone a few days and realized you haven't had a single glass of water? I, I do this all the time. I love diet soda. <laughs> um, I can go three days and realize and think about it. Like I haven't, I've drunk, in, I've drank pots of coffee, tons of diet soda, but not one glass of water. And then when my body begins to experience that feeling of thirst, I crave anything but water. I want more diet soda. Because once I've eliminated water from my intake, it's the last thing that I want. My body doesn't even say, hey, Chris, maybe you should have a glass of water. My brain doesn't even go there. However, after a few days of this, my body lets me know that something is terribly wrong and I feel awful. You see, the things that I've been replacing the water that my body so desperately needs with, the things I've been replacing it with, they're not good for me. So eventually, I surrender and I force myself to drink the water. And the more, but I realize the more that I drink the water, 
the more that I want the water, the more that I drink the water, the more that I crave the water, and the less I crave the diet soda. It's so much like, this, it's so much like our relationship with the Lord. When we push him away, our bodies, our minds, our souls, we crave him. But when we neglect our relationship with the Lord, we desperately fill the void with anything else. John 4:14 4, says, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is Jesus speaking. You see, drinking the water of life requires regular interaction with the source of the living water. No one can continue to drink the water of life that if he or she neglects the relation, their relationship with the Lord and becomes disconnected with the source of the water. Our small G gods, they never fill, fill the void. They only serve to pull us further away from the Lord. But when we finally surrender and we seek him, when we drink him in and we submerse ourselves in his word, we begin to long for him. We begin to long for his presence in our life. My point is, is that God's presence in our lives is the key to breaking the cycle of failure. God is all we need. He is the solution to the sins of our past, the sins of our present. He's the answer to our problems for today and our promise for a forever future. The more we seek him, the more we will long to be in his presence. And the more we long to be in his presence, the less we're going to seek after the gods of this world, the less attractive the things of this world are to us. So my fellow believers, let us seek the Lord. Let us turn our hearts to him and ask ourselves, why would we want to be like everyone else when we can be who God says that we are? Friends, we are blessed, we are loved, we are redeemed, we are free, we are chosen. We are his children, and we are forever a part of his story. Amen. You may be here today, and you may be feeling far from God. It could be that this is all new to you, or maybe you were once close to God, but you've since gone your own way. I just want you to know that God's promises are not just for a select few. They weren't just for the Israelites. But they're for you too. In fact, God's story includes you also. God loves you so much that he sent his son to pay the penalty for your sins, for, for all of our sins. Now, Jesus never sinned, but he died on the cross as punishment for our sin. And after three days, he came back to life and now offers everlasting, to life, everlasting life to anyone who calls upon his name. If this is you today and you say, I want to find my story within God's story, if you're saying, I need his mercy and I need his forgiveness and I want to say yes to Jesus, please repeat this simple prayer with me now. I'm going to ask everyone to bow your heads. Father in heaven, I know that in my life I've not always followed you and I have chose to go my own way. I also know that I've sinned and I've hurt you and for that I am truly sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus, your only son, died on the cross for my sins. I am so thankful for his sacrifice. Lord, I am ready to trust you as my Lord and give you leadership over my life. I guess I ask that you guide me so that I may follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.